ఓం నమో భగవతే వాసుదేవాయ ఓం నమో భగవతే వాసుదేవాయ ఓం నమో భగవతే వాసుదేవాయ Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 8, Text 21 Translation and Commentary By His Divine Grace Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Krishnaya Vasudevaya Krishnaya Vasudevaya Vasudev Please say Vasudev Not Vasudev Vasudev Krishnaya Vasudevaya దేవకి నందనాయకోపకుమారాయ గోవిందాయ నమో నమ లెట్ మీ దే ఫార్ ఆఫ్ అ మై రెస్పెక్ట్ఫుల్ అబీసెన్సెస్ అన్ టు ద లార్డ్ హూ హెస్ బికమ్ ద సన్ ఆఫ్ వాసుడే ద ప్లెజర్ ఆఫ్ దేవకి ద బాయ్ ఆఫ్ నంద అండ్ ద అదర్ కౌ హెడ్ మెన్ ఆఫ్ వృందావన్ and the enlivener of the cows and the senses there's only translation in croatian is there hmm? they can understand croatian for pot the lord being thus unapproachable by any material assets out of unbounded and causeless mercy descends on the earth as he is in order to show his special mercy actually you could just read it in croatian then inconceivable mercy of shrila prabhupad we are fortunate to be gathered here today to celebrate shri janmashtami the birthday of krishna who never takes birth ajopi sanavya yatma bhutana vishwaropi san prakritim swamadishtaya sambhavami atma mayaya Krishna says although i am unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates still i appear in this world by my own transcendental energy so it's a great subject how krishna has appeared he explains it briefly <coughs> in bhagavad gita he has appeared amongst us he is the very purpose of existence he is the basis of existence and to know him is the very basis of is the very purpose of existence and there's a saying to know him is to love him he is a lovable person we see some people are in this material world also we see some people who are very by their nature everyone likes them isn't it there's some people like that so krishna is like that to the ultimate degree he is the most lovable person which naturally makes him very popular krishna is very popular he's the most popular person all the worlds all the people of the spiritual world all the living being millions of living beings they are simply focused upon krishna in love some may be envious of that and therefore they don't love krishna and that that means all of us and we've come to this material world but krishna is so lovable not by any displays of charisma or any such things but he's so genuine he has such genuine love that even if others don't love him which is unnatural for them he still loves them therefore krishna comes into this world and displays his wonderful pastimes and speaks bhagavad gita just so that we can understand him 
Because to know him is to love him. And if we love him, then we no longer have to stay in this material world. And Krishna will be very pleased that we come to him. We don't have to suffer. And Krishna, whose happiness is unlimited and unbroached by, that means not, it's not impeded, not stopped by our not loving him. It's not that Krishna, his happiness ceases because we cease to love him. But on, on the other hand, still his happiness is increased. Although his happiness is unlimited and it's unimpeded by our not loving him, still when we turn our face towards him and love him again, still his happiness increases by that. And therefore, great devotees of the Lord, they try to bring others to Krishna so that Krishna will be more pleased. Because the devotees of the Lord are always trying to increase Krishna's happiness. So to know Krishna is to love him. Janma karma chame divyam evam yobeti tattvataha taktva dehang punar janma naiti mameti sojuna. And to know him means to be liberated, to understand the transcendental nature of his appearance. It's not an ordinary appearance. And the transcendental nature of his activities. One is automatically liberated and one goes to Krishna. But one cannot go to Krishna simply by knowledge. It's not that simply one can get a, a if one gets a bhakti shastri degree, that means he's guaranteed to go to the spiritual world. It doesn't mean that at all. Or if one does a PhD on Krishnaism, that will not help. But one has to love Krishna. And actually it's only possible to know Krishna is to love him. But it's only possible to really know him unless one loves him. So it sounds like a contradiction. Which comes first? Should I try to love him and then I'll know him? Or should I try to know him and then I'll love him? Both things go simultaneously. One cannot love a person one doesn't know. If we are to tell you that you should love I know someone called, I'll have to give an English name because I'm not very good at Slovenian names. I know someone called Gordon Parker. He gave the name. You should love him. Okay? How can you love him? You don't know him, never saw him, you never heard of him. Where does he live? What does he do? How can you love? You have to know about him to love him. One may think that, well, at least I have to see him, then I can love him. But Krishna's qualities are so great that simply by hearing about his qualities, one can completely fall in love with him, like Rukmini Devi. She simply heard about him from Narad Muni, and she thought, oh, now I'm betrothed to marry this nonsense Shishupal, but I want to marry Krishna. My life is going to be spoiled if I marry Shishupal. So she sent a messenger to Krishna. Krishna, please come and kidnap me. You already took my heart, so you better take the rest of my body too. Take me all. So simply by hearing about Krishna, one becomes attracted to Krishna because his, by his qualities he's all attractive. And even by chanting the names of Krishna, if one, even if one doesn't have knowledge of Krishna simply by chanting his names that will awaken attraction for him because Krishna's names are non-different from Krishna. However, it is also important to hear about Krishna so that we can know about Krishna and be guided on the path of reviving our dormant Krishna consciousness by performing activities that are in relationship to Krishna. This means bhakti yoga. So it's a, it's a composite process. It's not just hearing about Krishna, chanting about Krishna, serving Krishna in various ways, offering Krishna food, flowers, so many nice things can be offered to Krishna. 
and by offering them to Krishna, then our love for Krishna awakens. But we should also know who is Krishna. This Prabhupada, at the, at the beginning of Krishna book, in his introduction, he writes that many people in the Western countries, when they see the picture of Krishna, they ask, who is Krishna? And who is that girl with Krishna? So in the introduction, Prabhupada answers the question, who is Krishna? And significantly maybe, Prabhupada doesn't answer the question, who is that girl with Krishna? That may be not your business. Who is that girl with Krishna? That's his own private affair. Of course, the answer is given in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam, in the pages of Krishna book. Actually, in Bhagavatam, Radharani is, she's there in every syllable, but she's hidden. So, but in Krishna book, Prabhupada reveals her more. So, who is Krishna? Prabhupada explains in the introduction to Krishna book, because actually this Krishna, Leela, to hear about Krishna, one should first understand basically who is Krishna. He is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One should understand him as such. Yomam eva samuro jyanati purushottamam sasarva vidbhajati mam sarva bhavena bharata. Krishna says, whoever knows me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead without doubting, he knows everything. One should know Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Purusham Shashvatam Divyam, the eternal uh, divine person. Mm. One should know Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead from Bhagavad Gita and then from Srimad Bhagavatam. There are nine cantos before the tenth canto. So Prabhupada gave the tenth canto in the form of Krishna book. And just to give people some proper focus, he gave an introduction explaining who is Krishna. Although actually even in millions of books, it is not possible to describe fully who is Krishna. But Prabhupada gave that in that introduction. And actually we've throughout the tenth canto of Bhagavatam also, in the prayers of different devotees, in the statements of Shukadev Goswami and Vyasadev, in Krishna's statements himself, about himself, it is defined who is Krishna. Because Krishna, even as he appeared in this world, he was a great mystery. People, they couldn't understand him. Many people, even Shishupal, of course, he was not a very nice person, he, which is why he ended up getting his head cut off. Um, but he brought up the objection when Sahadev, he gave the suggestion that uh, among all the honorable persons present at this Raja Surya Yagya, Krishna, he should be honored first because he is the most honorable person. He is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Shishupal, hearing this, because he was a demon, he became angry. Demons don't like to hear Krishna praise. Devotees like to hear Krishna praise, but demons, they become upset. So Shishupal, he spoke words of uh, blasphemy against Krishna. But actually, by the attitude, what he said was blasphemous. But actually his words were quite correct, if understood in a different way. For instance, he said that no one, we can't even understand who this Krishna is. He began, in Vedic culture, everyone, everyone's position should be defined. And if it's not known who you are, then people are afraid have anything to maybe maybe for a, to an outcast or from the lowest caste or it should be a person should know who they is and he should be able to tell others very very uh, precisely even telling all his forefathers back to Lord Brahma 
He should be able to give the whole list if required. I mean, not every time you introduce yourself. You can just say, I'm in, I'm in such and such a gotra. You know, but if necessary, you will say the whole line going back to Brahma. So, uh, the Shishupal was saying, we don't know, he's, he, first of all, he seemed to be like a, a Vaisha, and then afterwards he seemed to be like a Kshatriya. What is this? You know, yes, Krishna is unknown. There, here we have the prayers, of, this verse is from the prayers of Queen Kunti. So, she addressed him as being Anna is, is difficult. Anna is difficult to understand. Krishna, not what is it? Not your not not your not your dharam matha. Maya javani ka chhanam agya dhoksa jama vyayam nalakshya se murha drisha not your not your dharo yatha. That Krishna, you are eternally, you are covered by your covering potency. You are not visible to by the material senses and therefore foolish people cannot understand you. You are, you are invisible just like an actor is dressed up. You can't understand who he is. So it's, it's difficult to know Krishna. But it's possible to understand Krishna. How? How is it possible to understand Krishna? That, any answers to that one? So Krishna is not understandable by the material senses. It's a clue to a well-known verse. Atah Shri Krishna Nama Adi Navaved Grahya Mindriyai Sivon Vukhe Hiji Vada Swayam Eva Spuratinda Krishna is not available, not understandable, not perceptible, not understandable by the material senses. Perceivable, not perceptible. Because Krishna is not uh, yeah, he's not available to the material senses. The Krishna, his name, his form, his qualities, his pastimes, they all remain ununderstandable by the material senses. But if one develops an attitude of service to Krishna, which begins by engaging the tongue in chanting his holy names and tasting Krishna prasadam, then Krishna in reciprocation, reveals himself to such a devotee. So that Krishna is described in the tenth canto of Bhagavatam. Here Kunti Devi is describing Krishna, how he is Krishna, the Supreme Lord, Vasudev, the son of Vasudev, who is the son of Devaki and Nanda Maharaj and all the elderly inhabitants of Vrindavan and who is known as Govinda. So how he is the son of Vasudeva and the son of Yashoda, all these mysteries are described in the 10th canto of Bhagavatam. And there also, there it is described who is Krishna. Krishna is. There are so many things we could say. Krishna is. Krishna is great. Krishna is the greatest. He's the smallest. Krishna is the most fair F A I R. Oh, that's a, that also. It's not the spelling. It's the word. Krishna is the most fair. It means he's the most just, because he's not fair in the sense of bodily hue. He's dark. <laughs> so Krishna is the most fair. He's also the most crooked. Don't try to cheat Krishna. He's a better cheat than all of us. So, who is Krishna? There are many statements in the Srimad Bhagavatam, throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam. Srila Bhaktisiddhan Saraswati Thakur, he compiled from the 10th canto of Bhagavatam, which I'm going to read out now. You're going to have to have some patience or taste for hearing. 145 statements about Krishna, beginning, Krishna is. And actually, these are not all the statements about Krishna from Bhagavatam, because there are many more, actually, from, from the 10th canto. 
he is from the tenth canto of Bhagavatam. Srila Bhaktisthan Sarsar Thakur has extracted 145 statements about the how Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. But there are many other statements about him in the tenth canto which he's not included. For instance, I, I didn't see that. No, he's not included this kind of statement. For instance, the gopis say that Krishna is kitava yoshita, means a cheater of women. So this kind of statement, surata vardhana, one who increases the... Uh, surat literally means sexual affairs, loving affairs. So one who increases the loving affairs, so such names, he is not included. This is, he's, he's not, and not in any, doesn't seem, it's not in the uh, order that they appear. Anyway, he is number one. Krishna is possessed of an unlimited intellect. It may not seem like that. He seems like an innocent cowherd boy. But he knows everything and understands everything. Krishna knows everything. That is stated by Lord Krishna himself in Bhagavad Gita. What does he say? I wasn't thinking of that one. Sarvasicha hungry disanivishto. No, there's a better one than that. Anyone? Veda ham samati tani vartamana ni charjuna vavishani chabutani. The mount to Veda, that will come in the next Krishna is. So, Krishna knows everything past, present, and future. Not only does he know it, but he knows it from all different angles of understanding and he understands it fully. It's, it's inconceivable how Krishna can, can know everything. But on the other hand, he must know everything because he's maintaining everything. Every atom and particle of an atom, Krishna is maintaining. So he knows that. And how everything is interacting with each other. Any one of these statements... They could be the subject of millions of books. Krishna is possessed of an unlimited intellect. Then, number two, Krishna is inaccessible to sensuous knowledge. Oh, Bhaktisthan Sarsar Thakura used to use the term empiric knowledge, which means more or less the same thing. Knowledge which is derived from the senses from the mundane senses. Krishna cannot be understood by such knowledge. Therefore, Bhavishani uh, Chavutani, what is it? Mantu Vedana Kaschana. No. But I am not understandable. Krishna, actually, Krishna is not understandable even by purified knowledge. But he's understandable to some extent. But he is not at all understandable by the empiric method. Therefore, people who do research in the universities into by the by this mundane scholarly method, such people they can probably tell you the whole. They could probably explain the whole philosophy of Gauriya Vaishnavism, maybe better than our devotees. They could explain it, but you, no one could ever become Krishna conscious by by hearing such an explanation from a mundane scholar. Because they don't understand, they may think that they understand it, but it's only an extrinsic understanding. Because Krishna can only be understood when he agrees to be understood. Patyatvananya yashakya. I, I can only be understood, Krishna says, by bhakti, not by any other process. So simply by making... We may think we can understand some subject matter by studying it. There are so many things being studied in the university. The, the mating habits of nocturnal frogs. and So you have to... Someone has to... A big scholar has to stay up at night crawling around in the mud 
looking at frogs so he can write his PhD on the mating habit, which doesn't matter. It's a completely ridiculous subject anyway. But anyway, some people are interested in such things. Instead of being interested in Krishna, they're interested in the mating habits of nocturnal frogs and other such useless subjects. So if we think that we shall study Krishna, someone is studying biology, someone is studying mathematics, someone is studying geology. So these subjects are all fascinating, no doubt. Mathematics is fascinating. It's amazing how numbers interact with each other. The, the qualities of pi, I'm not talking about apple pie. I'm talking pi, you know, you must say it in your language. The, the Greek symbol is given. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an infinitely indeclinable number. I can't remember that. But it's, it's amazing. If you study mathematics, how the numbers relate with each other in so many different complex ways, it's amazing. So people find some... If you study anything, you'll find it's amazing. If we, if we study matter, raw matter, that's the study of physics. If we study atoms and then subatomic particles, and then we find they're not particles, they're waves. It's amazing. It's fascinating. Then if we study the cosmos, how the different planets are moving, the stars and the, the comets, and it's, it's fascinating. Any subject is fascinating. But Krishna cannot be understood by the... Actually, even nothing can be understood very well by an empiric method. Because we have limited intelligence, whereas Krishna has unlimited intellect. We have limited intelligence. So if we think that just by employing standard methods of observation inquiry, hypothesis and coming to conclusions as we do with other subjects, we shall understand Krishna. It is not possible to do so. It is not possible. Krishna can only be understood when he reveals himself to us. Number three, Krishna is Lord, the Lord of the infinity of worlds. We're just talking about cosmology. Someone is studying cosmology. They're studying this vast universe. How many light years away is the nearest star? The vast universe. But we have information from the Vedic literatures that this universe is only one among unlimited universes. And actually this is the smallest. So we are studying vast universe. So many stars. If you look in the sky at night, if you're not in Ljubljana, because in the city there are so many street lights, but if you go out in the mountain area, then you'll see at night so many, so many stars. But these are only in one small universe. And there are so many universes and Krishna is the Lord of them all. And there he is running in Vrindavan with a little bit of yogurt in his hand. His mother has given him some yogurt and he's licked it and some is still in his hand and he's running. Krishna is inconceivable. Krishna wields the power of creating the unlimited. How, yeah, it's a little, maybe a little difficult to understand. Krishna wields the power. You can say has the power. But wields means to exercise the power. To use that power. Krishna wields the power to, of creating the unlimited. Now, just think about that. What does it mean? How can one create something which is unlimited? How is it possible? 
You can only create something which is limited. You can't create something which is unlimited. Because we are limited and this material world is also, everything within it is limited. But Krishna has the power to create the unlimited. So there are so many... If we take the vast expanses of universes, the, we say the material world is limited, but practically, all, if we put all the material universes together, it's practically unlimited. The Vaikuntha planets are unlimited. Although they're not created, but it's, it's said like that, that they're created by Balaram. Just like the sun rays eternally exist with the sun, nevertheless, the sun rays are dependent upon the sun, So Krishna creates the unlimited. The unlimited can create the unlimited. With our limited brain power, we cannot understand what unlimited means. But that's another facet of the unlimited. Another facet of the unlimited is that the unlimited cannot be understood by limited brain power. Number five, Krishna carries the impress of limitless power. That means uh, Krishna is by his very features it is understood that he has limitless power. Of course in his Krishna feature as a young boy it may not seem like that but particularly in his four-handed Vasudeva form then he has he holds the Shankar Chakra Dada Padma, the uh, conch, the disc, Sudarshan disc, Shankar Chakra, the, the club is also working. From Pondraka, he imitated this. But these four emblems, they are the emblems of Lord Vishnu. And his Discus is not any ordinary discus. That's Sudarshan Chakra. And his club is not any ordinary club. It's What's the name of Krishna's club? Komodaki. So these are... And... Uh, what's the name of his? Shankar, Konch. Panchachandra. And lotus, I don't think he has any name for his lotus. So these are the signs that he has unlimited power. Krishna is possessed of inconceivable potency. Who can think of any pastimes of Krishna which show his inconceivable potency? There are so many of them. Brahma Vimohana Leela. That's the very good example. That's the first one that came to my mind also. In which Brahma, uh, he appear to, to himself and to others in this material world, he appears to be the most powerful person and to have practically unlimited potency. But then he saw this Krishna who is supposed to be greater than him, is supposed to be the giver of potency to him, to Brahma. Running, uh, looking, running around, looking after some cows. Why would the, why would God do that? So Brahma stole his cows and he stole his cowherd boys, and then Krishna showed to Brahma that, my dear little boy Brahma, <laughs> you are thinking you are very big and mighty, and I'm just a little boy. But actually, you are my little boy. You are born from me. I'm your father. And although by my mercy, you have got some potency, which to you, just like a little boy, any little boy, when he gets a little strength, he feels, I'm so great. But actually, you're just a little boy. Let me show you something of my potency. Oh... 
then Brahma felt like a little ant. And actually, there's not that, from Krishna's perspective, there's not that much difference between Brahma and a little ant. Just like at the school, the young boys go, five-year-old boys, they go to school. So they may be fighting amongst themselves. Young boys in school here, they fight, they punch each other and all this kind of thing. They do that? No. Okay. At five years old? Here in Slovenia also, they bring bombs eh, to school. They're catching up with, the, with America. So among the five-year-olds at school... There may, there, may be, there may be, say, 40, 50 in the school, five-year-old. So among them, one may be very strong and compared to the others, he's, he's the local bully and he's, there's no one to compare with him. So he, you know, he's the, really much greater than the others. And all the other five-year-olds are afraid of him. And they respect him. However, great that five-year-old fighter may be, there's not much difference between him and the weakest boy in the school in the eyes of the world heavyweight boxing champion. To the world heavyweight boxing champion, the greatest fighter in the school, five-year-old, and the weakest, they're just the same. They're both insignificant. They're so insignificant that they're not, there's no question of, just like the five-year-old may come and say, hey, I, I want to fight with you. The world heavyweight boxing champion. Fight with me? <laughs> just like when Indra attacked Vrindavan with so much rain, then Krishna first of all considered, now I should smash him. But then he thought, why should I bother? He's so insignificant. This Indra, all the, all the demons are afraid of him and all the demigods are also afraid of him. He has this thunderbolt. But Krishna, Krishna thinks so. You know, he's attacking me. It's, uh, you know. It's just, just like a little child runs up to a, a big strong, oh, I attack you. Just to impress others. You know. oh, he's a little child. You know. Boom! <laughs> oh. So Krishna has unlimited potency. Brahma is creating one universe, not even creating, he's just doing a little, moving things around. But Krishna, and, and Brahma, he has to do austerity, and he has to uh, do, he has to do, it's a lot of work for Brahma to create. But Krishna creates millions and billions and trillions of universes just while he's snoozing. <laughs> He doesn't have to do any work. He just, oh, when he breathes, ah, oh, and all millions of universes breathe, ah, breathe in again, ah, oh, and it's all the universes come back. For Krishna, it's no work. He doesn't have to do any austerity to create anything. He has unlimited potency, inconceivable potency. Number seven, Krishna is unborn. So again, this, Krishna is, he's inconceivable. Krishna is unborn, then why are we celebrating Janmashtra? It means the day that Krishna is born. What does it mean? Is that Krishna is never born as we are born. He's not born due to his previous karmic reactions. But he's unborn in the sense that no one, he is anadiradi. He is be beyond timelessness. He's before timelessness. 
He's before time and he's before timelessness. No, no one is the cause of Krishna. Krishna is the cause of everyone. So he takes birth from the womb of Devaki. But it's not that he is caused by Devaki. Krishna is not caused by the interaction of semen and ovum. Krishna takes birth by his own desire. Number eight, Krishna solves all heterogeneous views. There are so many different opinions. And people who are atheistic propose that all all views are as good as any other. But Krishna solves all actually it's heterogeneous views. Heterogen. Heterogeneous. Yeah, I don't could be pronounced either way. I'm not sure. <laughs> so uh Krishna solves all philosophical mm, vadas, different theories, by appearing and showing that I am the absolute truth and destroying persons who have no faith in this and destroying all their wrong theories in Bhagavad Gita. All the different... People may have different many, so many different theories and people have written so many books of philosophy but Krishna finishes them all off and gives the real understanding by speaking Bhagavad Gita as it is. So for persons who are confused by so many different opinions, I, I, I remember I had this experience that I was just... Someone is saying this, someone is saying that, someone else is saying that, and so on, and just, oh, totally, totally com- so confused, you don't want to listen to what anyone else has to say. And then Bhagavad Gita says, oh, at last, something that makes sense, so many different opinions, and all of them nonsense. And then Bhagavad Gita as it is, at, la- at last, that one opinion, which is fact, which is reality, which is the absolute truth. So, all these different theories that are prevalent in the world, we may ask, well, how can people accept them if they're not correct? To this it may be said that all of these theories have at least a semblance of correctness. There may be some semblance means resemblance. They resemble the correctness. Or they may they may have something correct in them. Just like there's so many different things. Beauty is truth. This is a saying of John Keats, an English poet. Beauty is truth. Of course, you can imagine what the poet's idea of beauty is. A beautiful body, but that is not truth. Because its own beauty is skin deep. That kind of beauty. And even if you consider the beauty of skin, it's not very beautiful. If I was to offer you, just like the Nazis used to make wallets and cover books with human skin. They had a lot of it. So, if I was to offer, here, here's a wallet. I'd like to present you with a wallet. This is made from human skin. You wouldn't think that's very beautiful, would you? You If you said, well, it's actually from a very beautiful woman. It's okay, but you keep it. So, beauty is truth. 
or the beauty of nature. But that's also temporary. And actually even the beauty of nature, we see beautiful forests. What is that forest? That is trees and many other living entities having taken that form and suffering due to their sinful activities. And it cannot be the truth because it is subject to decay. The truth means that which is infallible. The truth means that which is not destroyed. If it's subject to destruction, it's not. The, it may be a relative truth. It may look nice now, but the truth means that which is sat chit anandam, satyam shivam sundaram. These are different terms. That which is eternal, full of knowledge and bliss. This is the analysis from Shastra, what is truth. Satyam, which is true, that which is Shivam, that which is which is uh, auspicious, and Sundaram, that which is beautiful. So truth is beauty, yes, but what is actually beautiful? That is Krishna. He is truth. So, Krishna, so anyway, you see, any one of these topics, one could speak for days. So we have, we got through eight. We have another a hundred and thirty-five to go. So I'd better go a little quicker. Krishna is vanquished. Vanquished, you know what that means? Conquered and destroyed. By Prema, love, exclusive devotion. Krishna is unconquerable. A well-known name for Krishna, unconquerable, is Ajita. So there is a famous line in the Bhagavatam, which this must be from. Yes, it's from the, this uh, Brahma's prayers. That uh, the unconquerable is conquered. Ajita Jita. By exclusive devotion. Krishna is conquered. He's destroyed. Not exactly destroyed, but that he is the supreme controller. He becomes controlled by his devotees. The elderly gopis, baby Krishna, they're, they're clapping and singing and baby Krishna is dancing. Ekali Ishvara Krishna Ara Sabha Vritta Jara Jaitche Na Jara Tare Toiche Kare Nritta There is only one supreme controller and he is Krishna. And all others dance according to the way he makes them dance. That is Krishna. But Krishna is dancing to the tune of the gopis because of their exclusive devotion to him. Krishna is the inner guide. What is the word for that? Anyone know that? Chaitya Guru, yes. He's the inner guide. Our consciousness, of course, if our consciousness is pure, then we will get pure direction from the inner guide. But at least if our intent is... Otherwise, if people say, I have to follow my consciousness, that can be very tricky. Because Krishna impels us, or He gives us intelligence according to our desires. So if our desire is not pure, then what we call our consciousness will, be, will, be, will not be pure either. If someone says, well, I acted according to my consciousness but that may it may seem to be good to us but if our conscious if our consciousness is uh, contaminated by material desires then what we think is good may not actually be proper at all just like Arjuna he didn't want to fight he's he was a conscientious objector do you have such a term there's a term in English, conscientious objector. It means someone who declines to fight for his country at the time of war due to his consciousness. 
that I cannot fight. I believe it is wrong to fight. So Arjuna was a conscientious objector. Now Yodsya iti Govinda. Govinda, I will not fight. I'm following my consciousness. But then Krishna explained to him that actually your consciousness is polluted. You're a damn fool and a rascal. What the hell your consciousness? So then he purified his consciousness by giving proper knowledge and then Chaitya Guru who was standing before him as his actual as his Shiksha Guru, Krishna. He followed the direction of Krishna. But Krishna asked Arjuna that what do you want to do? After explaining Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, Krishna told him that Yatecha Sita Thakuru. Now I explained everything. You act as you think best. You act according to your consciousness. Before you were saying according to your consciousness, I will not fight. Now you have heard everything from me. Now what do you say? Now you consult your consciousness. And Arjuna said, Nashtomo Hosmati Labda, Twat Prasada, Maya Chuta, Stito Svigata Sandeha, Karishe Vacharantara. That now, Achuta, I was fallen down, but you never fall down. By your mercy, I've gained my original consciousness and now I'm fixed in that. And the very man who had said, I will not fight, said, I, now I'm ready to do what you say. So Krishna is our inner guide. But we shouldn't take that, I'll just follow my inner guide. We should be guided by an outer guide also. And of course, outer guide or Guru who gives shiksha, main function of Guru is to give shiksha, also guides, but he may not be present all the time with us. It's not that the, the Guru is a babysitter. The Guru has to be, to be with you at every moment. But we, sh- we should be with him at every moment by taking his instructions. So at every moment we can consider what are those instructions and put them into practice in our lives. So between the inner guide and the outer guide, we go to Krishna. It's a very big topic. That's only one. Krishna is the withholder of the energy of the wicked. The rascals, they have some facility to be rascals in this material world. But Krishna does not give them unlimited energy. For some time, they may show their strength. But they can, ultimately the wicked, they can never prevail. Because Krishna doesn't allow them to. Just like Hiranyakashipu asked Prahlad, what is the source of your strength? I got so much strength to conquer the universe, Hiranyakashipu was thinking, by performing terrible austerities and you my son Prahlad you never did anything you're just a little boy but you have so much strength that you can defy me it means you've got more strength than me so where did you get your strength from? you wanted to know where did you? not just out of curiosity you're thinking I'd like to get that strength also so Prahlad replied that the source of your strength and the source of mine is the same But I recognize it and you don't. Because I recognize it, I get more power from him than you do. You thought that you got power by your own endeavor. But actually that power came from Krishna. You don't recognize that. So Krishna is only giving you limited power. You think you have unlimited power. But I have got more power than you. Without doing anything to get it. Because I simply accept that Krishna is the source of all power and he gives me the power to defy you. Actually, I don't do anything. The devotee doesn't try to become very powerful. He simply tries to serve Krishna and Krishna empowers him. 
Krishna gives energy to the wicked, but not unlimited. For some time, he lets them play out their little game. Just like little boys, they play games. That of, they play young boys. They play games of wars and fighting and conquering. And then when they get bigger, they play the same game, but in real life. It's just why anyone wants to conquer over another. It's just childish play. Hiranyakashipu thought he was such a great person, but he was just like a foolish little boy. I want to conquer the universe. She, I'm bigger than anyone else. Just like a little boy. But Prahlad Maharaj, who was a little boy, was actually much more wise than him. Krishna is the giver of salvation of jivas that are free from vanity. Vanity here means ahanka, false ego. Persons who are free from false ego get liberation, not by their endeavor. If someone thinks that, but I will, I will become liberated by my own endeavor. But liberation means to be free from false ego. But if you think that I will liberate myself by my own ego, that in itself is false ego. By my own strength I will become liberated. How can you become liberated if you're thinking I will become liberated by my own strength? Because that is, it's, it's impossible. You can't be, we can't be free from false ego if we have the false ego of thinking I will free myself from false ego. You follow? Hmm? One cannot be liberated from false ego if one has the false ego of thinking I will liberate myself from false ego. It's an, it's an impossible, it's like a conundrum. It's impossible. So it is possible to be liberated by the grace of Mukunda. If one simply depends on the grace of Mukunda and stops thinking, I am the doer, I am simply a servant of Mukunda, then one can attain liberation because he gives it. No one can liberate themselves. But... Krishna can liberate. We are tied up in this material world. Krishna can liberate us. No one else. Not even Shiva or Brahma. Krishna ordains the worldly course of conceited jivas. Conceited here means uh, those who have the... No, it doesn't mean puffed up and proud. It's a different use of the word. It's an... It's an almost archaic use of the word conceited, like a Victorian use or something. Here, conceited means those who have the abhiman, the, uh, it's like a hunker, or the thinking of themselves as a product of this material world. Those who think, I am part of this material world, they are thinking, I am acting and I'm making plans and I'm doing this. But actually it's all under the control of Krishna. Again, any one of these topics could be a whole big class, but I'll try and go through it fairly quickly. You have to have patience to listen to this and a taste for philosophy. But You see, we're supposed to be fully absorbed in hearing and chanting about Krishna. So let's see if we can do it for one day. <laughs> Actually, it's supposed to be every day. But uh, this is why Prabhupada said we should, don't try to be a Babaji because we have to do some work for Krishna because we don't have the taste simply to hear and chant. So Krishna is the primal God, Deva. The word Dev, Deva. We say we may say Indra Dev, Chandra Dev, Surya Dev, the names of different demigods. But the original God is Krishna. Dev, Deva. Krishna is the primal person. Purusha. This is all stated in Bhagavad Gita also. That uh, 
What is that verse Arjuna spoke describing this? Parang Brahma, Parang Dhamma, Pavitrang Paramang Brahma. Purusham, Krishna is the primal. Purusham Shashvatam, Divyam. So these words come. He is the eternal primal person and the primal Deva. Purusham Shashvatam Divyam. Divyam and Deva. They come from the same root. Who shines. Purusham Shashvatam Divyam. Adi Deva means the primal primal God. Ajam, Vibhum. So, uh, Krishna is an overwhelming flood of bliss. That's nice, isn't it? We're hearing about Krishna's ontological position. But it's not simply how he's great, how he's the original, he's the most powerful. That is one aspect of understanding Krishna. But another aspect to understand how he is the reservoir of pleasure. Prabhupada gave this in English, the reservoir of pleasure. An overwhelming flood of bliss. Krishna possesses fulfilled desire, apta kama. His desires are fulfilled. Whatever he wants, he has. His desires are fulfilled. It means, I get what I want. You've seen that advert all over India for some tobacco, some cigarette. I get what I want. Of course, no one in this material world gets what they want. And even if they get it, they remain anapta kama. They they remain unfulfilled in their desires. So Krishna, this word apta kama comes, uh, Shukadev Goswami is describing just when he's going to describe the rasa dance, that although Krishna is fulfilled in all his desires, still he desired to dance with the gopis. So Krishna is apta kama, all his desires are fulfilled, and he's also atma rama, he is self-delighted. He takes pleasure in himself. We may do also. We may look in a mirror and think, how wonderful. And then combing our hair. That's one reason we shave our heads. And ladies bind it up so you just can't comb it all day. Otherwise, so many times you see the current they like to. Even, I can't understand actually why they go on combing and combing. There's no need. I mean, you comb it to put your hair in place, right? They just go on and on and on and on. Just because it's an excuse to stand in front of the mirror and look at their face. which is I never saw such a wonderful face. Even if it's got spots and warts and, and pop marks. Everyone thinks, I'm so beautiful. That is foolishness. But in Krishna's case it's not. He takes pleasure in himself. He is the most beautiful, the most powerful, and he is the source of all pleasure. So he takes pleasure in himself. And intelligent persons, instead of looking in the mirror at their lousy, ugly face, they keep nice pictures of Krishna and look at that. Because Krishna is the reservoir of all pleasure. Because we are considering ourselves God, We take pleasure in ourselves in this material world. But that pleasure that we take in ourselves is soon shattered by Krishna in the form of time. And our beautiful body ends up getting burned. Or if you're in a Catholic country like Slovenia, buried. Krishna is the opponent of the sinuous. Bhaktisthan Sarsar Thakur's language. It's... Unusual, sinuous. You'll hardly find this word used in English. Uh, I had to look it up actually in the dictionary. Krishna is the opponent of the sinuous. So it means someone who's got a big, strong body, lots of muscle. Krishna takes pleasure in fighting with them. He is the opponent of those 
who think that by my strength I will conquer over others. So Krishna takes pleasure in fighting with such people. He's the opponent. And therefore Krishna has many names which when you think of sinuous, you think of a big strong body like a wrestler. So Krishna, his one name is Chanurari. He's the enemy of the Chanura. One of Who knows who Chanura is? I just gave a clue. Anyone? One of Kangsa's wrestlers. One of the wrestlers that was called by Krishna. There are many, but Chanura and Mushtika. So the first is Chanura. So Chanurai, that means it's like a generic term. Chanura, Chanura and all the others. Krishna was the enemy. Of course, Balaram killed a bunch of them too. Krishna is the opponent of the sinuous. Krishna is sung by the best of hymns. Who can think what that name is? Best of hymns, best of verses. Uttama Shloka. Uttama Shloka Charitam Sarva Loka Sukhavaham. Krishna is praised by the best of verses. And hearing about Krishna gives pleasure to all the pious people throughout the whole universe. So Uttama Shloka. There are many verses. There's so many verses. You could have a verse. Verses means the Vedic literature is composed largely in verses. But particularly those verses which are directly meant for the praise of Krishna, they are the best of all. Therefore, he's called Uttama Shloka. Krishna is the dispeller of the night of pseudo religion. Tamasima Jyotir Gamaya. This material world is darkness. We should come to the light. What is the light? The light is to understand. Krishna, Angtad Vishnu Paramang Padang. What is that? Angtad Vishnu Paramang Padang. Sada Pashanti Surya. The devotees, they always look up to the effulgent spiritual world, which is the abode of Krishna. Krishna Surya Sama. Maya Hoy Andhaka. Jaha Krishna. Taha Nahi. Maya Adhika. Where there is Krishna, there is light. There is no... Krishna is just like the sun. Just as in the presence of the sun, there is no question of darkness. So in the presence of Krishna, there is no question of maya. So pseudo-religion, generally you think, oh, religion, that's very good. But that is also darkness if it is pseudo-religion. So Krishna by appearing in this world, gives the actual, uh, he establishes what is actual religion, Bhagavad Dharma, surrender to me, and thus destroys all wrong theories about religion. Krishna is devoid of increase and decrease. Krishna is not material. Therefore, he's, he's perfect and complete, and he, he neither increases nor decreases. In other words, he's immeasurable. Of course, sometimes it's said that Krishna is always increasing. But he's already immeasurable. So, that is a, that is a kind of saying. Krishna is always, he's immeasurable, unlimited, yet he's always increasing. Yet he does not increase from the material point of view, Krishna does not increase, nor decrease. Krishna never becomes less. It's not that, as some rascal so-called philosophers say, that God created the world, he must have died a long time ago. Because it was a long time ago when the world was created. No, Krishna does not decrease. Krishna is the efficient and material cause. There are different causes The standard example of this is that to say, what is the cause of the pot? There is a clay pot. What is the cause of the pot? The cause of the pot is clay. That's right, isn't it? But it's also, you could also say the cause of the pot is the potter. 
That's also true. So the material cause is the clay and the efficient cause, the one who makes it, is the potter. So Krishna is the efficient and material cause of everything. Krishna is the universe and he's the cause. He is the instigator of the universe. He is everything, he's in everything, yet he's aloof from everything. This is big philosophy. <laughs> Krishna is the only truth. Any so-called truth not in relation to Krishna is not actually truth. It may be called a relative truth, but it's not an actual truth. Just like it may be true to say that uh, this is my brother. He was born two years before me from the same mother and father. Therefore, he is my brother. It is true. No one can say it is not true. But it is a relative truth. It is relative upon us having these bodies. It depends upon us having these bodies, which was not true before we were born, which was a short time ago, and will cease to be true after we leave these bodies. So it is true, but it is not actually true. It's a relative truth. It depends on conditions. It depends on the existence of this material world, which is also destroyed at a certain point of time. So there's no actual truth in this material world. There are relative truths. But these are, they're not actual, substantial truths. The only substantial truth is Krishna. Krishna is the only truth. Krishna is the awarder of the fruit of work. I worked hard and I became rich by my own effort. No. Krishna gave. If we think that I got everything by myself, then we become a big thief. Because Krishna is giving. Krishna is not subject to the consequences of work. Namang karmani limpanti. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I am not under the rules of karma. Whatever we do, there is some reaction, either good or bad, depending on whether our work is good or bad, but not for Krishna. Everything Krishna does is good in an ultimate sense. but not in a material sense. So there's no karma for Krishna, either good or bad. Some very nonsense rascal people, they, they think like that. These Jains, yeah, people think, oh, Jains, they're very good, they're vegetarians, but their philosophy is abs their philosophy is most hellish. They say that, anyway, it's almost unspeakable. They say Krishna did so many bad things, he's suffering in hell. What are rotten rascals? Or there's other Brahma Kumaris. Ah, it's such nonsense. They say that, well, Krishna will come again, but next time he'll be completely moral. Last time he was immoral, but he was still a very advanced soul. He spoke the Bhagavad Gita. No, actually, they don't believe he spoke the Bhagavad Gita. They say Lord Shiva. They're really, really way, way off. Anyway, they say Krishna, he was immoral, but he will come again next time in a fully moral form. So these statements are there in Srimad Bhagavatam just to counteract such people that are so eager to go to hell that they make statements like, or they think like this about Krishna. So Krishna is not subject to the consequences of work. Krishna is the seer of cause and effect. He sees everything, but he's aloof. He's not subject to it. He is, in one sense, he is the, cause, he is the primal cause of everything. These are all big subjects of philosophy. You'll see in Srimad Bhagavatam some small statements. Krishna is the seer of cause and effect. Krishna is the material and efficient cause of everything. This big, big philosophy behind all this. Just in, a, just in two or three words, there's ah, big, big philosophical arguments are finished. The whole of Sankhya philosophy, cause and effect, 
uh, it's all a study. Cause and effect. What is the cause? What is the effect? Is Finished. Krishna is everything. Krishna is the person who is time. Krishna is time. Krishna is another feature of Krishna. Sorry, time is another feature of Krishna. Now generally it's considered that time is impersonal. Sometimes it's an impersonal. You don't see time. You know. We see time by its effects. Just like if I was to go away from here and meet you all again after ten years, then I would see you all looking older. And you would see me looking older. And maybe one of two of us wouldn't be around. Say, what happened to him? Well, uh, you know, he Dehanta Prapti. He he was subject to the influence of time in the form of getting another body. So the the effect of time can be seen, but impersonally. But here Bhaktista Dansasar Thakur is pointing out from Bhagavatam that Krishna is the person who is time. It, it's not ultimately it's not impersonal. Everything is going on under the direction of Krishna. And then, almost similar, Krishna is time's own self. Time that appears to be an impersonal force, the very personage of time is Krishna. Krishna is in the heart... Oh, sorry. Krishna is even the time of time. What does this mean? It is very difficult to understand. But the point is that even if time is considered as uh, an independent force, just like different philosophers, they may conceive of time as being some force that is not that is independent of Krishna. But no, Krishna is. If we think of time as some force independent from Krishna, then even that time, Krishna is the time of that time. Just like Krishna causes death to the Lord of death. So there's no avoiding Krishna. Krishna is in the heart of every animate entity like fire inside wood. Where is Krishna? Krishna is in everyone's heart. We can't see Krishna. Cut up the body, cut up the heart. You won't find. You may say, well, that's the proof that Krishna is not in everyone's heart. But yes, he's present. But how is he present? Like fire is present in wood. Fire is there, but cannot be seen by cutting up the wood. But it is there dormantly. That is understood that if you place a small flame against wood, that will become so much fire. And the fire is coming out of the wood. That means the fire is in the wood but it cannot be seen. There's a, only by a particular process to bring that out. So Krishna is within everyone's heart but cannot be seen. There is a process to bring Krishna out, to manifest Krishna. And that is just like you touch fire to wood and so much fire comes out. So in the same way if we bring Krishna to the living being in the form of his name, his prasadam, his devotees, then Krishna becomes manifest in that person. Krishna is grateful. Krishna is not an ingrate. Any small service done, Krishna never forgets and he always rewards. So we should go on serving Krishna with a great confidence Krishna is very grateful. He will never forget what we are doing. Krishna is the augmenter like the full moon of the ocean of earth, gods, twice born and animals. And I must admit, uh, I'd have to look that up to see what it is because I don't understand it. <laughs> so I won't try to explain it. I'd have to Oh, really? The augment usually means that which, yeah, which makes greater. But exactly how like the full moon. In Sanskrit, there's often very poetic language. I should have done my homework. 
before I just sat down and read this. Over, I was overconfident. <laughs> Krishna is the tormentor of cannibalistic persons. It means rakshasas. Rakshasas torment others, but Krishna torments them. Krishna is the destroyer of the pride of the arrogant. Krishna is so kind to arrogant people that he destroys their pride, which is the causing their, by their arrogance, arrogant people cause suffering to others. But they also cause suffering to themselves. By that attitude, they commit sinful activities. So Krishna very kindly destroys their pride. In the case of Brahma, Brahma wasn't exactly arrogant, but he was overly confident. Uh, Indra, could, by sending the rain clouds to Vrindavan, that could be said to be arrogant. And certainly persons like Pondraka, Shishupal, Jarasandha, they were certainly very arrogant. So Krishna destroyed their pride. They were thinking, I am very great. But Krishna smashed them. So that their arrogance was smashed along with it. Krishna is the root cause of the origin, etc., of the world. Origin, etc., means Janmadiya Zayataha. Uh, the creation of the world, its maintenance and its destruction. So Krishna is the root cause of that. Actually, when, when we say Krishna is the creator, that means in his Vishnu feature. So Krishna is the origin of Yatovama, Imani, Bhutani, Jayante. Krishna is the root cause of the Yena Jatani, Jivanti. So the uh, Shristi Stiti Pralai, creation, maintenance, and destruction of the world, Krishna is the root cause of that. Krishna is the cause of the world. He's the root cause and he's the cause. He's the remote cause and he's the more... There are various stages of causes. Just like someone may... In the factory, someone may push a button and cause a chemical reaction to take place. So it can be said that that person who pushed the button, he is the cause. But he would... Someone may come and say, why did you push the button? because I'm working under my supervisor. And the supervisor will say, well, the supervisor is working under the factory boss. And the factory boss is working under the... The manager of the factory is working under the owner of the factory. So like this, there are various levels of administration of causes. So Krishna is the root cause, but he's also the intermediate cause, because Krishna is everything. There's a lot of philosophy in the tenth canto. This is all from the all these from the tenth canto of Bhagavatam. So actually, Bhakti Sansar Thakur wrote this when he was on Brajamandal Parikrama. Mm -hmm. So generally, we think the tenth canto is only lila, but actually, it's full of philosophy also. So this is only a tiny part of the philosophy in the tenth canto of Bhagavatam. Krishna is the creator of the world. Now we're coming down root cause, cause, now creator. These are different levels of stratification. The creator, Brahma is a secondary creator. And the original creator is Krishna. Krishna appears as if possessed of a body like that of mundane entities for the good of the world. For the good of the, for, to benefit the world, Krishna comes into the world and appears to have a form like that of any other human being in many ways. Narakriti Parang Brahma. The absolute truth has a form like that of a human being. Krishna is the guru of the world. Now here... Guru of the world, Jagat Guru, Vishwa Guru. Here, Bhaktisthan Sahasra Thakur has explained the word Guru as center of gravity. If we want to study Bhagavatam in a scientific manner, we will find that the center of gravity is Krishna. Because gravity, that 
That's what the scientists call the the attractive force or the that the physical attractive force which holds things together. But in that sense, Krishna is the most he is the attractive force. In another way attractive. Now Krishna is the center of gravity. Gravity apart from meaning a force that is described in physics, it also means the quality of graveness. Being grave. Krishna is very grave. That means, grave means, it's the opposite of frivolous. Very grave. And Krishna is also frivolous sometimes. But not so frivolous. I mean, he's frivolous, apparently frivolous in his pastimes as a young boy in Vrindavan. But he never, he, he never becomes so whimsical that he gives up his duties as Vishnu in maintaining the universe. Krishna is the refuge, ashraya, of jivas, individual souls, who are afraid of birth and death. We find this many times in the 10th canto of Bhagavatam, that great devotees, they approach Krishna and say, I'm very afraid of birth and death. Please give me shelter. So, it's good to be afraid of birth and death. It's good to be afraid. A devotee is fearless, but we shouldn't be so fearless because we've... A devotee is fearless because he's taken shelter of Krishna. But a devotee is still afraid. It's good to be afraid of Maya. It's not good to think that, well, I'm not afraid of Maya. If we think like that, then we're in difficulty. We will be. We should be afraid of Maya and always taking shelter of Krishna. Krishna, please protect me from Maya. Krishna is devoid of birth. That we've already explained briefly. Krishna is equally the internal guide, cause, and director of jivas. Yeah, so these have been explained. He's the internal guide. He directs the jivas. Just like someone, they directs the jivas means the, every, the jivas they have different desires. So he directs them how to fulfill that. Just like, at least in India, if you just drop a little, say, honey on the floor, then very soon there'll be so many ants coming to get it. Or if some, it's very common, some some dog may be killed on the road, then very soon there'll be all crows all around it to eat the dead body. Like the vulture they they can see if some it's it's said in Shastra that if vultures start to come around you it's very inauspicious. That means you're about to die. <laughs> the vultures they know. So the, the Krishna directs every jiva to get what they the vultures somehow they may be ten miles away, but somehow they get to know. That means Krishna within that there's some cow is dying over here. Often, often you see the cow is lying down and they're about to die and the vultures are just hopping on their body, just waiting. They're cowards. They don't do anything until the animal actually dies. Krishna is the destroyer of the miseries of persons who employ themselves on meditating upon Him. Just like we were singing the Dashavata Stotram. Shrinu Sukadam Shubadam Bhavasaram. That by, in this world of birth and death, which is miserable, if one simply hears about Krishna and his various avatars, then that is all auspicious, means destroys all miseries and gives us happiness. Krishna is the fourth dimension, Turiya and self-manifest. So, there are, it's considered in this world, there are three dimensions. Length, breadth, and height. Plus a fourth is time. 
So Krishna is the fourth dimension. And Krishna is self-manifest. An adi radigo. He he manifests himself. Krishna is worthy of being gifted. This literally means that Krishna is good to be given away, but I think it should mean that that uh, one should offer a gift to Krishna. Krishna is the right person to offer things to. We like to offer gifts to others. We like to see them become happy. But the right person to offer gifts to is Krishna. Krishna is the punisher of the wicked. That's fairly straightforward. And he's the god of gods. There are so many demigods, but the god of all of them is Krishna. He is the supreme. Yet, Krishna is rarely cognizable by the gods. The gods who people pray to in this world, the different demigods, people pray to the demigods when they get in trouble or when they want something. But when the gods want something or when they get in trouble, they go to him. But then they cannot see him. They stand on the shore of the ocean of milk and sing the Purusha Sukta. But they cannot, generally they cannot see him. That's why he's so kind. He's come to this world. He cannot generally be seen by the, by the demigods. But he comes to this world and is seen by ordinary human beings. That is his great mercy. Just imagine how great is his mercy appearing in this world. Krishna is unconcerned about body, house, etc. Krishna has everything, but he's not concerned. He's concerned about the love of his devotees. Krishna is the supreme ruler of the greatest gods. Yeah, the, the greatest gods are Brahma, Chandra, Indra, Surya, Vayu. They are very great from our angle of vision, but he's far above them. Krishna is the exponent of religion. He speaks Bhagavad Gita. He teaches what is actual religion. Krishna is the eternal son of Nanda. Nanda means Ananda, pleasure. Krishna is not the son of anyone. He is unborn. That has already been stated. Now it's been stated that he is the son of Nanda. He is born of pleasure. He is pleasure. He is the source of all pleasure. But it may be said that he's born from pleasure because his father's name is Nanda, which means Ananda. Krishna is visible to man with great difficulty. Krishna cannot be seen by any material process. Actually, it's very easy to see Krishna if one has got the eyes of love to see Krishna. Otherwise, Krishna is very rarely seen. And even if he's seen, he won't be understood by materialistic people. (laughs) Krishna's presence mocks the world of man. This is wonderful. Here we are living in this world. We're proud of our great society. We build so many buildings. Whoever, this brewery we saw as we were coming past from Harinam, just around the corner from here, Union Brewery, So the owner of the Union Beer Company must be proud of this modern, fancy-looking brewery. And the architect must be proud. And the the, the constructor, those who built it, and the construction company, what what a wonderful thing. This is one of the best sites of Ljubljana. It's it's an architectural plus. So we are, we are proud, or just I'm from Britain. As Prabhupada said, the British are the most puffed up people in the world. So our Britain is so wonderful. Rule Britannia. Britain is so great, even though their football team always loses and their cricket team always loses. But nevertheless... There was once a great empire. So we are the British. Or whatever. Everyone thinks they're great. I used to laugh. In, I, I was in Bangladesh. And there, at that time, now there are more cars. At that time, there are very few cars. 
and lots of cycle rickshaws. So the people who had cars, they were the Bangladeshi people who had cars. There are not many of them. They, but they had reconditioned Japanese cars. That means cars the Japanese threw away. They, they, put, a, they, they put a new engine or re, re-souped up the engine and sent it to Bangladesh and sold to the richest Bangladeshis. And they'll be driving around. You'll sit them, see them sitting in their car with a hired driver. And they'll look very proud. I have a car. And you now this is a car that in the, in the West, you know, some, a father may give his kid on their 17th birthday when they're allowed to drive. So just some useless old car, they, they drive around and smash it up. So we're so puffed up. Whatever we have, every ma- the, a pauper is proud of his penny. It's an English saying which Prabhupada quoted. You know what that means? A pauper it means a poverty-stricken person. A pauper is proud of his penny. That means among among penniless people, someone someone somehow or other gets a hundred dollars. So he goes back to his slum and says, "Hmm, I've got a hundred dollars." Hmm. So Krishna mocks the world of men. Everyone is so proud. I am so great. I am so wonderful. Whatever it may be. We're American. We went to the moon. We're American. We can, we are the most powerful country in the world. Krishna mocks. Oh. Just with one little glance, Krishna destroys the whole material world. What to speak of this tiny universe? What to speak of this tiny planet? What to speak of this tiny America? Or really tiny Slovenia. Krishna mocks. I mean, I can, coming from such a great nation as Britain, I can mock Slovenia. But Krishna mocks. He doesn't directly mock, but just his presence makes everything seem what it is, insignificant, meaningless, child's play. So wonderful description of Krishna. What number are we on? I'm not lost. Yeah, 56. Only another 89 to go. If you don't like, you can go away. I'll enjoy. Krishna, ah, oh, this is really, this is very nice. Krishna is the object of palatable drink of the human eye. It, uh, this, uh, this is actually the first words that I ever read in Prabhupada's books. In Vrindavan, Krishna was the sinusure of all eyes. Sinusure means the object. The sinusure of all eyes means that what the object of what everyone was looking at. It means everyone was attracted to look at Krishna. Ah, Krishna. Ah, ah, Krishna. Ah. They all wanted to see Krishna. Because... To see Krishna is compared with drinking a just the pleasure you get from a nectar, drinking nectar. So drinking nectar through the eyes. That is Krishna. There's that story that that Dhanodas, I was talking about him yesterday. He was a, with his wife, he was very beautiful. And he was always looking, he was holding an umbrella over her head and looking at her all the time. And Ramanuja saw him and thought, this man is a great fool. He's overly attracted to his wife. So he said to him, why are you always looking at this, this, this woman? I, actually, I don't think he was ever his girlfriend. She was a prostitute or whatever. He said, you see, have you not seen such beautiful eyes? How can I not take my eyes off her eyes? They are so beautiful. So Ramanuja said, I can show you more beautiful eyes than that, if you will agree. Ah, you cannot show me more beautiful eyes than this. There are no more beautiful eyes. Yes, I will show you more beautiful eyes. If you say you can, you take me, but I don't believe. Then he took him to the temple of Ranganath, Lord Vishnu. Just see these beautiful eyes. 
by the grace of Ramanuja, Ramanuja Acharya, his uh, Dhanadas had the vision. Oh yes, these eyes are much more beautiful than the uh, than the material eyes. So Krishna is the nectar for the eyes to see Krishna. Krishna is the internal guide of all. Yes, so this is a repeat. Krishna is worthy of the worship of all the worlds. Krishna is worthy of the worship of all the worlds. So sometimes people say, why are you doing this? You're doing all this worship of Krishna. So our answer is then, why are you not doing? Everyone should do. Everyone is worshipping someone else. That tendency to worship is that if we don't worship Krishna, we worship a, in the modern age, they'll worship a football star or a cinema star or a pop star. But these poor people are not worthy of worship. Krishna is worthy of worship. He is the proper object of worship, even for Lord Brahma. So what to speak of insignificant beings like ourselves? Krishna accommodates all the worlds. Accom- yes. So, just like for instance, uh, if Durvasa Muni was to come here today, would you be able to accommodate him? You say, well, why not? Durvasa is only one person. No. Because wherever Durvasa Muni goes, he goes with his disciples and he has 60,000 disciples. So if he was to visit Iskon Ljubljana and say, I'd like to come to the Janmashtami festival, he said, there's no space. Now we, don't, we only have this courtyard. Usually everyone goes in the temple room. Today we're having the festival in the courtyard, but we don't have space for 60,000 people. What shall we do? Dovasamuni will get angry. You don't have space for me. What to do? Where is there enough space? Or the refugees are running away from one country and the soldiers on the other side are pushing them back then they're caught in difficulty. If we go back, we'll be killed and if we go forward, we'll be killed. Please let us come. No, there's no space in our country. We don't have space for you. We're already overcrowded. So there's limited space. But Krishna provides the space in which everything exists. Krishna accommodates all the worlds. Krishna is the manifester of all light. God is light. You ever heard that? People like to say. So that's true. God is light. But that's not completely true. Rather, it's true He's light, but Ra is not that light that is the sum total of God's godness. Rather, he is the manifester of that light. He is light because light is none different from him. You need a break, is it? Translating is hard work. Is there anyone else who can translate? Okay. Slower, huh? Okay. Krishna. Actually, I could use some water. You'd like to go to my room and get... There's a bottle of water, I know, but you don't know, actually. You know that glass of mine? And that, 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 that lota, yeah? And there's some water is there. And... Although I'm not the super soul within Divya Prabhanda Prabhu's heart, but I would guess that he probably needs some water also. So, Krishna is unstinted in giving himself away to one who recollects him. Do you know this word, unstinted? Do you know recollect? Recollect means to call to memory. To one who is all, who has the habit of remembering Krishna. 
No, unstinted means um, in this sense, in this context, you would means without any reserve. He doesn't hold himself back. He gives himself fully to those who recollect him. So recollect means to call to memory. Now we're always supposed to remember Krishna, but there may be directly and indirectly. That means we may be doing some work for Krishna, but we're concentrating on the work. Just like if you're cooking a chapati, you have to concentrate on it. You're doing it for Krishna, to offer to Krishna. But we have to concentrate. So we're thinking of Krishna because we're thinking of doing the service for Krishna. But the concentration is on making the chapati. You have to concentrate. You see, if you, if, if you, you might just forget about it for one or two seconds, but then you have to go back, otherwise it'll get burned. So you have to, it's, even to make a chapati, you see, you have to get the right kind of flour should be milled properly. If there's, if there's too much, if there's not enough brown matter, then it won't make a nice chapati. The, the bran. You have to get the white, right color. Then you have to mix it with water, just the right consistency. You have to leave it for some time. Then again, oh, you, have to, you have to mix it, means you have to knead it, but not too much. And then leave it for some time. Then you have to roll it out to the right thickness. And depending on the thickness, you have to have the flame just, of course, we're talking about gas fire here, but it may be on a wood fire. <laughs> or a cow dung fire. So you, have to, you, you just have to put it, and you, uh, comparing to the thickness of the you have to, the tower, you have to see that. What's that called? Tower? There's no English word for that. What, uh, whatever it's called. Pan, you could call, yeah. Then you have to put it, you have to see, you have, and it sh- you have to, anyway, it's very, and then you have to cook it just right. At the right speed, not too far, not too long, not too short. So it's a whole art just how to make a chapati. So you may be absorbed in that, doing it for Krishna. But then, when you're finished, you may have the oh, now, may recall to mind Krishna. Directly remember Krishna. So both are non different, actually. If we're fully absorbed in serving Krishna, that is as good as thinking of Krishna. And the result of that is that we will call to, automatically we'll remember Krishna. Just like some may come and chastise, why are you burning all the chapatis? You can't offer that to Krishna. Oh, that's true. So everything should be done in consciousness of Krishna. Or actually here on this side of the world, they, they tend to undercook the chapatis and not burn them. They're afraid of... Any little mark comes on it and they're afraid. But actually the mark should come on it. Anyway. So, who thinks? who is in that habit of thinking of Krishna? Krishna gives himself to that person. Krishna is the efficient cause. That's already discussed. Krishna although devoid of all mundane quality, assumes mundane qualities by his inconceivable power for the purpose of creation, etc. This means that Krishna has no contact with this material world. He's complete. He is, but he appears to be in contact with it for the sake of manifesting this material world. So these are the guna avatars. Vishnu, Brahma, Shiva, Lord, Vish- Lord Krishna assumes these forms. Even though Krishna is beyond all mundane qualities, Krishna ob- assumes these forms in the mode of goodness, passion and ignorance for the sake of creating, maintaining and destroying the mundane world. Krishna is not subject to change. This material world is subject to change. Krishna is not subject to change. There are six kinds of changes or transformation that everything in this material world comes into being. 
it expands or grows or develops, stays for some time, produces byproducts, dwindles and is destroyed. These are the sharavika, six kinds of changes. Krishna is not subject to such changes. We may say, well, Krishna also changes. He's a baby, then he grows up. But actually, no. Because Krishna's form as a baby is eternal. And how eternal? He was a baby and then he became grown up. Then where was the baby? The baby is eternal. The baby form of Krishna is in another universe because Krishna's pastimes are going on eternally. Krishna is not subject to change. Krishna is not capable of discrimination by reason of being void of any extraneous covering. Uh, what this means, I can deduce, is that uh, here discrimination is used not in the sense of making a, a judgment, but it's, it's, it's used in the sense of being discerned, which means being seen. This is very archaic, old English, actually. So, Krishna Krishna cannot be seen uh, by, re- by reason of being void of any... He doesn't have any external covering. So he can, but it would, it would be thought that if he has an external covering, then he cannot be seen. But here it's said that Krishna cannot be seen because he doesn't have an external covering. In other words, we cannot see Krishna if we think that he's an ordinary person of this material world. Even if we see him, we cannot see him. Just like Duryodhana saw Krishna, but he never understood he was the Supreme Personality of Godhead because he considered him an ordinary person. Krishna is the giver of himself to those who covet nothing. A kinchana gochara. Or a kinchana dhan is a better word. Krishna is the property of those who desire nothing in this material world. If we desire nothing, na dhanam, na janam, na sundarim, I don't want wealth, followers, women. Krishna becomes the property of such a person because he gives himself to such a person. Krishna does no work. Krishna doesn't have to go to the office or factory or work in the fields. He does work in a sense. He looks after the cows. But that is not work. It is all play. Even his creating, maintaining and destroying the material worlds. Everything for him is play. Krishna has no work. He's not obliged to do any work. Krishna is human, hidden, primal person, Purush. Narakriti. He has a human-like form, but nevertheless... He is hidden. Uh, his, his nature is hidden to those who he does not reveal himself to. He is the primal person, original person. Krishna is present in the hearts of jivas like the five elements. Just like the five elements, they're present in, within the material cosmos, but they cannot be seen. They're unmanifest. They're uh, you cannot see pure earth, pure... The element, when we say earth element, it doesn't mean... When we say earth, it doesn't mean you dig up the earth. That's not what it means. It means solidity. That which possesses solidity. Water means that which possesses liquidity. Fire means that which is hot. That's why we say fire in the stomach. If you do an x-ray of the stomach, you won't see any flames but it means that which has the quality of heat. So like that, the elements are present in the material world, but they cannot be perceived in the same way Krishna is present within every jiva. Krishna is the supreme sorcerer, the supreme mystic. We may manifest some mystic powers, Pull a rabbit out of my ear. Oh, it didn't work. Sometimes it works. didn't work today. Maybe because we're fasting. Anyway, sometimes I pull rabbits out of my ears. Actually, I don't. But some people know the trick how to pull rabbits out of their ears and perform various 
mystical tricks like bringing people back to life. Maya Dhanava did that. Jesus did that. It's a mystic power. Krishna is the supreme mystic, the supreme yogi. Krishna is the supreme Godhead and the internal guide of all. That's again repetitive. But again, to hear it again is very nice. Even though we've heard it just a few minutes ago, we can say it again. So let's say it one more time. Krishna is the supreme Godhead and the internal guide of all. And go on to the next one. Which is number 73. Krishna is the crest jewel of those whose praises are sung by the sacred law, L-O-R-E, law. That's a little bit. Law, you know what that means? Law here, in, it, means like a, it means like a literary tradition. You know that, huh? Okay. So, there are many persons who are praised in the Vedas. But the best of all, the persons praised in the Vedas, is Krishna. Krishna is. Krishna is the primal person and ever existing. He's the, he's the person who came before all other persons. Now sometimes people say, well, who created God? No one, if, if we say... The, the people think that's a good argument. But God, if at all we are to accept that there is God, then by nature, He cannot have any other cause. He is always existing. Krishna is the highest among the objects of worship. There are various objects of worship. Some people worship trees. Some people worship ghosts. Some people worship their forefathers. Some people worship uh, various demigods. The highest object of worship is Krishna. Krishna is the healer of the miseries of the submissive. This is very important. We hear a lot these days about healing. We have to get healed because we have so many psychological scars so there are various persons who purport to be our well-wishers. I will heal you of your psychological scars. But we should know that our real well-wisher is Krishna and he can heal us if we are submissive to him. The endeavor to heal others without being submissive to Krishna is another demonstration of one's enviousness of Krishna, trying to take the position of Krishna. So it is Krishna who heals. And if we simply take to the process of Krishna consciousness very seriously, then we will be... Seriously means here, submissiveness is stressed. Then we will be healed from our various miseries. Krishna is the destroyer of the sins of the submissive. As Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita, what is that verse? Anyone? Hmm? No. Krishna is the destroyer of the sins of the submissive. What's the use of learning verses if you don't know when to quote them? Sarvadhaman parityadja ma mekam sharanam raja. Ah, ahang tvam sarva pape bhyo moksha yishami masucha. Which means that uh, succinctly it is maybe stated that Krishna is the destroyer uh, of the sins of the submissive. Similarly, Krishna is the destroyer of the distress of the submissive. If we are distressed, oh, so much pain in my heart, go to Krishna, be submissive to Krishna. Krishna will 
destroy our distress. Krishna is the residue after the cataclysm. This is so wonderful. So many ways Bhaktisiddhanta Sahasra Thakur has compiled this, these excerpts from the 10th canto, selection from the 10th canto, of all different qualities of Krishna. When everything is finished, Krishna will remain. What's the names of these mountains in Slovenia? Is it still the Alps? Or it's the edge of the Alps, is it? It's the baby Alps. Oh, these are not the real big Alps, though. Huh? Yeah, it's just the beginning. So, so, sorry for being... You know, I come from Britain. We don't have big mountains there, but we look down on Slovenians anyway. Sorry? Almost 3,000 meters high. Well, we should go to the Himalayas. Actually, Prabhupada said about the, he was flying over the Alps once, and he, he was flying over Switzerland, and he said that these mountains go up to the next Varsha. So in some form, which we can't see, which Prabhupada can see, they're much higher than we think they are. You go up to the next planetary level. So anyway, uh, what are we talking about here? I got a little carried away. Yes, Krishna. So these mountains will not exist. They will be finished in due course of time. The whole universe will be finished. And what will remain? Krishna. When the mountains are finished, when the oceans are finished, when there's no more Adriatic Sea left to go to for holidays, then Krishna will remain. When all the planets are finished, Krishna will remain. Krishna is devoid of touch with the mundane senses. Mundane senses cannot reach Krishna. Mm. I should keep my finger here. Krishna is the soul and friend of all animate entities. Yes, he is the life of all that lives. Jiva, yes. One of Krishna's names is Jiva. We find in the Vishnu Sahasrana. Jiva, generally we think, this means the general meaning of Jiva is a living being, separate from Krishna. Jiva Tattva. Separate, but... Separated energy, separate and not separate. But the, the life of all that lives is Krishna. And because he is, he is the life, he's intimately connected with us. It's just like a mother is intimately connected with her child. The mother, at least superficially, gives birth to the child. Therefore, she always cares for the child. Even if the child doesn't care for her, the mother can never renounce her love for her child. So in the same way, Krishna gives life to all living beings. Therefore, he always loves all living beings. He is the life of all living beings and the friend of all living beings. Krishna is devoid of distinction appertaining to an alien. Maybe I'll just explain that. I'll explain it. It's it's not ordinary English. It's it's unusual English. So Krishna is not an alien. He's not a foreign person. He's not something different to us. He's not someone to be rejected. That he's a he's a foreigner. No, he's one of us. He is. He is not of a different nature to us. He is very much one of us. He is above us, yet he is very much one of us. Krishna is inconceivable by his nature. Yes, by his very nature, Krishna is inconceivable. Everything about Krishna is unlimited. So our, as as jivas as individual living beings we have limited capacity to perceive and to understand but Krishna is unlimited therefore by his very nature 
He is inconceivable. It's pretty good if you can translate this because it's pretty philosophical stuff. That's good. It's all 10th canto of Bhagavatam. Remember 10th canto. Sentimental people think we shall just listen to Krishna Leela. We only want the 10th canto. So if someone says, I only want the 10th canto, you can give them this. This is all 10th canto. It's Krishna consciousness is very much, it's all on a very philosophical basis. It's not sentiment alone. Krishna is the master of the universe. That should be fairly clear because even people where they with a very rudimentary under, uh, level of God consciousness, they understand that God is the master of the universe. Even any Christian or Muslim will tell you that. So Krishna is the master of the universe and he is the nourisher of the universe. It means we, every living being attains nourishment from food, from air, from water, the bodies are nourished. And emotionally, we are nourished by exchanges with others, maybe by music, by sleep. There are so many factors that lead to our nourishment, but they, they all come from Krishna. If we consider this material world, it's so complex. Krishna is the source of everything. Oh, this is very beautiful. Krishna is the sun that cheers the lotus of the kindred of the Vrishnis. So here, the Vrishnis are compared to a lotus. Now there are certain kinds of lotus. They, hmm? Oh, sorry. There are certain kinds of lotus that close up at night. And then when the sun rays come, then they open up again. Open and close. Can Bhavananda Rai grow some of them? Not here. It's too, they, they won't survive in the winter here. But the, so, there are similar flowers here. So the example is given that Krishna is just like the sun in relationship to the Vrishnis who are just like the lotus who they open up and become inspired and they show their beauty in contact with, with Krishna who is just like the sun. Krishna is the God worshipped by the Brahmanas. Does anyone know that term? Brahmanyadev. He is the God worshipped by the Brahmanas. Of course, he's worshipped by so many others. But particularly by the Brahmanas, everyone is supposed to, everyone in Vedic society is supposed to worship, do some kind of worship. But the Brahmanas especially, they spend so much time doing worship. And the true Brahmanas are those who worship Krishna. He is known as Brahmanyadev, or the God who is worshipped by the Brahmanas. Krishna is the foremost of the Brahmanas. Well, that seems very strange because Krishna appears as a Kshatriya or maybe a Vaishya. But he is the foremost of the Brahmanas. If, if we're going to believe in the caste system uh, by birth, then Lord Brahma is the first Brahmana. He took birth from Krishna. <laughs> Actually, Krishna is transcendental, but to all these castes. <clears throat> but he's the foremost of the Brahmanas because Brahma means Brahmana means Brahma Janatiti Brahmana. One who has got knowledge of Brahman, who has got spiritual knowledge, he is a Brahmana. So in that sense, Krishna is the foremost of the Brahmanas. He is the topmost spiritual knowledge. Krishna is the originator of Brahma. That I just said. He is the 
Brahma is called Ajja, one name, one who has no birth. But he is born, another name for him is Padmaja, who is born from the lotus. And that lotus is, uh, an, uh, Padmaja is also a name for Krishna, which means he gives birth to the lotus. So Krishna gives birth to the lotus from which Brahma takes birth. Krishna is the worshipped of Brahma. Yang Brahma, Varunendra, Rudra, Maruta, Stunvanti, Divyai, Stavai. All the demigods headed by Brahma, they worship Krishna. Krishna, this is not a Krishna is. And most of these are Krishna is. And now we have something slightly different. Krishna loves his devotees. How do we know? Because it's said in Bhagavatam. <laughs> Krishna, here's another one which isn't Krishna is. Krishna wears forms in accordance with the wishes of his devotee. Krishna assumes various forms for the satisfaction of his devotees. Just like Hanuman said, Srinathe Janaki Nathe Abheda Paramatmane Tasmat Namasarvas from Rama Kamalochanaha. He said that I know that Srinath or Narayana and Janakinath, Lord Ram, Srinath means the Lord of Lakshmi, Janakinath means the Lord of Sita. They are the same, non different personality of Godhead. But nevertheless, as far as I'm concerned, my worship of the Lord is the lotus eyed Rama. So Krishna assumes various forms for the satisfaction of his devotees. That doesn't mean that one can imagine any imaginary form and say this is God. Krishna has specific forms which are attractive to genuine devotees. And certain devotees are attracted to various forms. And uh, nevertheless, uh, according to scientific analysis, Rupa Goswami has analyzed that the most attractive form of the Lord is His original form that uh, that Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami also says, Krishna Jyote Kela Sarvotam Nara Lila Nara Bapu Tahar Sharup that among all the different forms of the Lord Rama, Nishringa, Varaha, Korma, Vamana the most attract, the topmost uh, the, the human forms the, 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 and among all his pastimes, his human-like pastimes are the most, they're the topmost because his human-like form is his very form. It's his original form. So Rupa Goswami has analyzed that Krishna, among all the forms, the most attractive is Krishna because Krishna has four specific Qualities which even the Narayan forms don't have and which even the Narayan forms are attracted to. We, there, there are so many. We just sung Dashavata Stotram, the, about the ten of it. But there are unlimited forms of the Lord, not just ten forms. But all these different forms of the Lord, Rama, Nishringa, Varaha, Koma, etc., they also worship Krishna. So when Gorya Vaishnavas can also worship various forms of the Lord, knowing that they are the Supreme Lord, yet they are also devotees of Krishna. Inconceivably so. So Krishna has four special qualities, namely, who can say? His Lila Madhuri, his... Uh, Amazing, incomparable pastimes, incomparable even to those of the Narayan and his very various. Is anyone else can say any of the others? Well, but we know now. We know you know. Is Venu Madhuri? Krishna has three kinds of flutes, namely Venu. Anyone? The other two, Venu. Vangshi and Murali. But his Venu, that's the little one. He just sticks it in his belt. It's convenient. 
So, the one special sweetness of Krishna is his flute playing, which charms all the worlds. The Yamuna becomes still to stop and listen. That which is liquid becomes solid. That which is solid like the rocks, they melt on hearing Krishna's flute. The calves who are so busy sucking the milk from their mothers, the cows, they stop. The deer becomes stunned on hearing the sound of Krishna's flute, which even Narayan doesn't have. Then, another? Anyone else? Two more? Anyone else can say? Anyone? All right, you see. Yeah, Parikama or Prima Madhu. He has his devo- Krishna's devotees are one of his special qualities. Of course, Narayan, Rama, and Shri, they all have devotees. But the devotees of Lord Krishna in his original form of... This especially means Krishna in Vrindavan, by the way. Because his, he doesn't play his flute outside Vrindavan. Because Kshatriyas don't play flutes. They, they have swords. Cowherd boys have flutes. So this especially refers to... These four qualities especially means Krishna in Vrindavan. So Krishna has... Uh, the, the devotees, the level of devotion they have for him is incomparable even to that of others. And then one more. Anyone from over there? One more special feature of Krishna. Rupa Madhuri. His, his form is the sweetest of the sweet. It's his, the very form of Krishna is so attractive that it even attracts Narayana. So... What what which one are we on? No, it's not. Krishna loves his devotees, isn't it? No, Krishna wears forms in accordance with the wishes of his devotees. So that was a little elaboration on that. Nevertheless, the Krishna has many forms, but the best form is Krishna. Krishna is eternally present in Mathura. He's a Mathura man. We may wonder why Krishna, he sometimes appears to be like a liar, a cheat, badly behaved, unreliable. Well, it's not surprising because he's from Mathura. And people from Mathura are like that even today. <laughs> we shouldn't make any offenses against them. But that's, uh, that's actually stated in Shastra that Krishna's... One devotee was saying to Krishna like this, well, what can we expect? You're a Mathura person. Krishna is eternally present in Mathura. Krishna is devoid of the sense of kinship and regards all in the same way. You know, kinship, in this material world, we think, this is my country, this is my family. And we, in this way, we have friends and enemies. Just like I heard in Macedonia, in English we say Macedon, you say Macedonia, isn't it? Yeah. That even today they have this kind of blood feuds which go on generation after generation, different families. Because 20 generations ago, one person in one family killed another. So it goes on from time to time. Some members of a family are sitting in a cafe and someone comes up in a car, jumps out with a machine gun and shoots them all dead and drives off. And then again, the members from that family, after some time, they go in their village and shoot them all dead. This is... Because this is an extreme example. Also we have, you see, like Northern Ireland. Because of the Battle of the Boyne, there was a battle which took place in 1700 and something. And the Protestants and Catholics are still fighting over that. What is the, if we ask them what is the reason that they're fighting, what actually are you fighting about? The Battle of the Boyne. That's 
Northern Ireland accent. It's because of the Battle of the Boyne. It makes no sense. Krishna is not like that. He loves everyone. He's devoid of a sense of kinship that these are mine, these these are my friends, these are my enemies. He loves everyone equally. Of course, if someone becomes his enemy, he reciprocates. But he doesn't have intrinsic hatred for anyone. Krishna is beyond all measuring potency known as maya. Everything within this material world is measurable. Krishna is not within this material world, therefore he's immeasurable. Just like you say, we, I bought some nine-inch deities. Krishna is not nine inches tall. Even sometimes deities, they get fatter or thinner, and maybe. Don't think that because they're in that form, they have to remain like that. When I was first, when I first gave the devotees the opportunity to show that they're genuine representatives of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, by let, they let me stay in the temple. So at Bhaktivedanta Manor in those days, you can see the photos. Radha, Gokula, Ananda were very thin because there was no money and the devotees were not feeding them very much. And then a new GBC came, said, came and said, feed them. So instead of offering about four tiny little sandeshes at Mongolarti, they offered 120 huge sandeshes, all different varieties, among other kinds of milk And that's only Mongolati. So they started feeding Radha Gokulananda and that caused a big problem because within two weeks none of their clothes fitted them anymore. And everyone could see how they were getting fatter. And the, the Matajis, they were all working day and night to make new clothes for them. I personally witnessed. I have mystical stories also about Krishna. So Krishna, of course they had to measure the outfit for the immeasurable Krishna. And interestingly enough, when they started to do that, the poverty-stricken temple where there was no money, so much money came. And now Bhaktivedanta Mana, so much money comes. Today alone on Janmashtami, they're going to collect hundreds and thousands of pounds. <laughs> so many people are coming. Prabhupada said, feed Krishna. Lakshmi she is looking after. Don't think we don't have any Lakshmi. If you don't have any Lakshmi, you won't have any Lakshmi. It means Lakshmi won't manifest. You feed Krishna and Lakshmi will make all arrangements that you can. Oh, you want to feed Krishna? All right, here, I'm, I'm willing to help you because that's my job. Lakshmi's job is to feed Narayana. So, now I have to find again. 96, I keep on losing. Krishna is subdued by the love of Yudhishthira. Specifically Yudhishthira is mentioned. Of course, all the devotees. But specifically Yudhishthira is mentioned. How wonderful is Maharaj Yudhishthira. He was able to subdue Duryodhana because... Krishna was submissive to him. That story is well known. Arjuna, acting on behalf of Yudhishthira, came to Krishna when he was resting in his tent. And Duryodhana came at the same time. They both had the same object. They wanted Krishna to help them in the battle. Because they knew Krishna himself can... He's already shown he can kill all leaf soldiers on any side just by himself. Krishna is the best fighter. So Arjuna and Duryodhana, they both came to get Krishna's help. And Krishna was lying down on his bed resting. So Arjuna waited at the feet of Krishna. And Duryodhana, being puffed up, waited by his head. 
thought, I'm not going to stand at his feet. So, when Krishna woke up, then he's, he, he opened his eyes and he saw, oh, Arjuna, oh, Duryodhana, I'm here too, oh, Duryodhana. So what do you want? And Duryodhana said, I want you to help in the battle, you have to help me. What do you want, Arjuna? Well, I also want you to help me, I've come to, for this. So Krishna said that, all right, you both came, so I have to help you both. So you can either take me personally or all my army, whichever you want. I, I'll, I'll give one to one and one to the other. But if you take me, I'm not going to fight. I'll just be with you. I can do something else like carrying water or something driving a chariot, something like that. But who to give the first choice to? I'll give it to Arjuna because I saw him first. And Duryodhana thought, oh no. And Arjuna said, Krishna, I have to choose between you and all your armies. I cannot choose. It is not possible for me to choose because I cannot even think of choosing. I can only take you. What is the value of anything else except you? And Duryodhana was thinking, hey, that's great, the fool. He took Krishna and he's, Krishna's not even going to fight such a fool. And I, Oh great, I'll take all the army. So, <laughs> Duryodhana was the fool. What is that? Jayatam Panduputranam Yesham Pakshe Janadana. The Pandavas must always be successful in fighting because Krishna is on their side. Even if he doesn't fight, they must be successful. Because, as is stated in, at the end of Bhagavad Gita, Yatra Yogeshwara, Krishna, Yatra Padana Dhanodharaha, Tatra Sri Vijaya Bhuti, Dhruvaniti Matimaha. Wherever there is Krishna, the master of all mystics. Even if he doesn't fight, he's the master of all mystics. He has the method to make everything work, even without fighting. And what to speak of Arjuna, who was fighting, and he's the best of all bowmen. So wherever there are these two, there is certainly uh, uh, there is certainly victory, morality, uh, tatra shriya. There is certainly auspiciousness, victory, and morality. Krishna is concealed by the screen of Maya from the sight of people. Show me God! I don't believe in God. Show me God. Cannot see Him. Just like if there's a thick curtain. You cannot see what is behind. So if we insist that we shall see without removing the curtain, it is not possible. And the curtain is removed from the other side. It cannot be removed from this side. That means Krishna himself will open the curtain. When Krishna is convinced that we are worthy to see him. Krishna does not follow the ways of the world. Krishna is different. We see often, especially that hippie generation, 1960s it began, they wanted to be different. They didn't want to follow the general way in which people live. The thing is that they all became, then they started growing their hair, which at that time for men to grow long hair was considered very bad. It was considered actually very, people thought it was something very bad, but something morally wrong that men should have long hair. So the hippies were different. The thing is they were all different in the same way. <laughs> they were all trying to be different, but they all did the same thing. And then there were different things that tried to be different. Then you had punk rockers who put 
things in, in nails in their noses and kept a rat on their shoulder and then they had green, red, blue and yellow hair on half the side of their head in spikes coming up trying to be different but the thing is that it was all too similar to each other they, they, they made they were all different but then they became just another category of material materialistic people so everyone's the, some people try to be different but intrinsically they have to follow the ways of the world they must suffer they may say well, I'm different you're not different you have to suffer birth, death, old age and disease just the same as anyone else but Krishna actually is different he is a di- he, he's not under the control of material nature he's not forced to follow the ways of the world he follows general morality generally but he's not forced to do so He's not forced to follow even Vedic Dharma. Although what he does is the ultimate Dharma. But he's not under the constraints of ordinary Dharma. Nor any morality uh, conceived of by mundane people. Nor is he... uh, Even different people invent different modes of living, subcultures. And Krishna is not... uh, He's not obliged to act according to any way that people think he should do. He is independent. Krishna is the destroyer of the fear of the mundane sojourn of the submissive. Is that the time? Quarter to one. Hmm. We are about two-thirds through now. We are going quickly. Just giving a summary of each one. Krishna is the destroyer of the fear of the mundane sojourn of the submissive. So that means the fear of of material life. Those who are in material life, if they be, that is a fearsome situation. But if we become submissive to Krishna, Krishna destroys the fear of material life. Number one hundred. Krishna is the womb of the scriptures. In other words, the scriptures come from Krishna. Krishna is Sri Guru of oneself. Krishna is the natural Guru of everybody. When we say Guru, what does that mean? Guru means representative of Krishna. The original Guru is Krishna. The guru means who rep- represents Krishna means he only speaks as Krishna speaks and only behaves as Krishna ordains. So Krishna is the ultimate Guru. Krishna is devoid of hankering for wife, offspring, etc. In the material world, everyone desires these things, unless one is a liberated soul. Krishna is a liberated soul. Krishna is so liberated that simply by thinking of him, one becomes liberated. So certainly Krishna has, even though he has wife, offspring, and all these things, but he has no mundane desire for them. He marries 16,108 queens to give pleasure to them and to experience the himself the spiritual pleasure of giving pleasure to them and being served by them but he has no mundane desire to expand himself as wife and children in the form of a family and children he has no such mundane desire he, he's already expanded himself as every living being and everything in the cosmos and everything beyond the cosmos. When we say Krishna accepts 16,108 wives, we may think that's very many, but actually every living being is part and parcel of Krishna. Every living being is by nature Krishna's wife. Already, it's not that Krishna, ultimately he doesn't marry anyone because everyone is eternally the servant of Krishna. Number 103, Krishna is the ordainer of the worldly sojourn and of the summum bonum. Yeah, and very simply we can say that Krishna, uh, he sets up the system by which there is a mundane world and a spiritual world. 
People say, why does this world exist? Why did God do it? God did. That's up to Him. He did like that. He made it. It's not ours to question why. Krishna is the cause of all entities. Already stated, Krishna is the friend of the good. Already it's been stated that Krishna has no particular attraction or to anyone. But at the same time, those who are good, those are his devotees, Krishna takes special care of them. He's specially friendly to them. Krishna is devoid of discrimination as of kinship. Yes, so that's also been stated. That Transcendentally, he has his friends, family, but not in a not in a material sense, because Krishna is Krishna is related to everyone, so he doesn't make any mundane discrimination. Anyone who wants to come to Krishna is welcome to come. Krishna is in existence. Just in case anyone thought this is all mythology, it is affirmed in the Srimad Bhagavatam that Krishna exists. Krishna is real. Krishna is true. There is nothing but Krishna. Krishna possesses true desire. The Buddhists have analyzed that the cause of all suffering is desire. This statement is partially true. The cause of all suffering is material desire. But the cause of all pleasure is real desire. Krishna possesses that true desire. Krishna is the true entity. He is the real thing. Coke is not the real thing. Krishna is the real substantive entity. Krishna is true of speech. As Queen Kunti Devi stated, that the sun may freeze and the moon may give forth hot light, but Krishna, the ocean may dry up, but Krishna will never renege on his promise. Renege means go back on. He will always fulfill his promise. Krishna is true of resolve. Resolve means his, uh, his decision to do something. So Krishna is not spaced out, this means. When he desires to do, he desires to do something and he does it. He doesn't think, well, maybe uh, mm, I should, I shouldn't, well, hmm, hmm. Krishna decides he does it. That is the sign of a great person, even in this material world, that they, do, they make a decision and they follow it through. Krishna sees with an equal eye. That's already being described. It's just being described in a different way. That he sees everyone equally. Krishna is the cause of all causes. Krishna is the originator of all. Krishna is the soul's own self of all jivas, individual souls. Krishna is omniscient. So all these things have been stated. They're just being stated again in a slightly different way. Omniscient means that that's one feature. When we say Krishna knows everything, knowing there are various factors of knowing. So awareness is one factor. Omniscience means awareness of everything. Awareness is one factor of knowing. Just like I am aware that this is a microphone. Awareness. Consciousness. But so I know this is a microphone. I don't I know that yeah, I know it's a microphone, it's an amplification, it's part of an amplification system. But I don't know how it works. I'm aware what it is, but I don't know how it works. So Krishna not only knows everything in the sense that he knows everything exists, but he also knows how everything works, how everything interacts. His omniscience refers uh, to his awareness of everything. Krishna is all-seeing. 
Krishna sees everything. Inside, outside. He sees into the very core of our hearts. Krishna is the Lord of all. This is also axiomatic. Just like that uh, anyone who believes in God accepts that they are the Lord of all. At least if they have a slightly personalistic understanding of God. He is the Lord of all. Krishna is the embodiment of all gods. That means that the, all the gods are personified in Krishna. Indra, Chandra, Vayu, they all have different functions. They take their power to do so and their, their, their function of doing so is embodied in Krishna. Just like Indra means king. The greatest king is Krishna. This, the, the Indraness of Indra is in Krishna. The Chandraness or, or the, the sense of being the, the, the God of the moon, that is in Krishna. It's all very interesting, at least to me. <laughs> I never thought of so many things. <laughs> this is all this is all this is all bordering on very complex philosophy actually. We could get into it more, but it's already ten to one and we lost half of them, but still you might as well stay to the end. There's only an we've been through uh We've been through 118 and there's only 27 left. So, no, no, wait a minute. We've been through 120, only 25 left. Krishna is the stay, ashray of all entities. Ashray means shelter. Here, Bhaktisthan Sarsartaka uses the word stay. Again, in, a, in an ar- all practically archaic sense. How to explain that? The, uh, the stay that that in hmm? the yeah, yeah it's I have to get a dictionary to define it. I know what it means, but just to yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah, he's the he's that in which all living beings. Exist, but which also not only they exist in it, but it also means that uh, he supports them. Stay in this sense means like support. So Krishna gives shelter, means gives support of all living beings. Krishna is all pervasive and eternal. Actually, we got as far as 122, we didn't get this all pervasive yet. That's an important quality of God. That's again something which all theists will say, that he's all... Perf- Actually, it's, it's almost... Im- if we don't understand this properly, how Krishna is all pervasive, then we'll, we'll take God to be impersonal. Mostly people say, oh yes, God is everywhere. He's omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. He's omnipresent, yes, but also andantarasta paramanu chayantarastam. Goloka even if satyakila mabuto. That's the one I'm looking at. He's in everyone's heart. He's everywhere. But he's also in his own abode in his original form. Golok. Mm. Which number are you on? Yeah. Krishna is the soul of all elements. Hmm. Element means there's no soul. But Krishna is the soul of all elements. That that which gives existence to the elements is Krishna. Krishna is the knower of the minds of all elements. Do elements have minds? Ultimately they do, because all the elements are represented by various demigods. Just like the earth, Bhumi Devi, water, 
Varuna, fire, Agni, air is Vayu, and Isa, who is the god of Isa? Is it the Ashwini Kumas? Is it? It may be, I don't know. You can check it out. Krishna is the soul's self of all elements. I'm sure if Bhaktis Dhanasas or Thakur is going to explain it, he could do, do so, but this is getting, this is the difference between this, between the soul of all elements and the soul self of all elements. This subtlety is beyond my level of penetration at this particular point in time. Krishna is the internal guide of all elements. How the elements are, you see, volcano or the avalanche, earthquake, all the elements are moving. Krishna is under Krishna's direction. Krishna is the cause of the origin of all elements. The cause of the origin. So origin also means like cause. So even if we, by uh, scientific analysis, find out that there is some material cause of the element, still there is a cause of that material cause which is Krishna. The ultimate cause of everything material is non-material. There cannot be an... uh, the ultimate cause of everything material cannot be material. It must be supramundane. That is Krishna. Krishna is the limit of all good. Krishna is unlimited. But if we find out the best person in this world, we'll find a better person is Krishna. Just like in the modern era, Mother Teresa has been much lauded for the good work that she did for others. But the good that Krishna does is far, far greater than the good that millions of Mother Teresas together could do. The doing good that she does is limited. The doing good that Krishna does is unlimited. Krishna is omnipotent. He has all power to do all things in all times and all places and all circumstances. No one can check Krishna's desire. Krishna is the Lord of Lakshmi, the presiding deity of all riches. So if you want Lakshmi, better not to try to take away, as Ravana did, try to take away Lakshmi from Narayana. But serve Narayana and you will get Lakshmi also. You may not get Lakshmi in this world, you may or may not, but we will get Lakshmi. Krishna. And if we get Krishna, then Lakshmi comes. Krishna is the internal guide of all, already said. Krishna is the stay, Ashraya, already said. Krishna is the witness and seer of the self. Yes, Krishna sees everything and witnesses everything. Krishna is the refuge of the good. Those who are not good, those who are not devotees, they do not take refuge in Krishna. We see that various demons, they have worshipped various demigods. Just like Ravana worshipped Lord Shiva and Hiranyakashipu worshipped Brahma. But we never find that any demon worships Vishnu. Because if they worship Vishnu, they'll become purified. And then they won't be a demon anymore. And they don't want to be purified. By their very nature, they want to be a rascal. So, Krishna is the refuge of the good because the materialistic people who approach demigods they want something material from them and they know they can get it from them but if you were, if we worship Krishna even for a material boon we don't know whether he'll give it or not he may not give it he may rather if we worship him he may take everything material away from us but he takes everything away from us and gives himself to us. So Krishna is the refuge of the good. The bad do not like to come to Krishna. And that is the symptom of their badness. That is the the, uh, main characteristic of their badness, is that they do not like to take shelter of Krishna. Mm. Krishna is most difficult to serve. 
Sounds very strange. You see, we're talking about Hiranyakashipu, how he approached Lord Brahma by performing very difficult austerities. Ravana also, by great austerities, he approached Lord Shiva, and Lord Krishna says, Patrang Pushpang Palang Tayang Yome Bhakta Prayachati Tadahang Bhakti Uparitam Ashnami Prayatatmana. If you offer me with love, leaf, flower, fruit, or water, I will accept it. So how is Krishna difficult to serve? It seems very easy. It is very easy, but there's just one condition by which Ravana could not worship Lord Vishnu. He could perform severe austerities, but there is one thing too difficult to do for Ravana by which he cannot worship Vishnu. And the same for Hiranyakashipu. Very severe austerities, but he could not worship Vishnu. It's too difficult for him to worship Vishnu. He can stand on one toe for thousands of years and be, his whole body rot away and his be covered by an anthill. He can do, that's difficult. But there is something which is too difficult for him to do. And that is to give up his false ego. To become submissive and admit that there is someone greater than me, namely Vishnu. So Krishna is difficult to worship if we are puffed up. Otherwise it's very easy. Krishna is the friend of one's heart. This means suhrit. In Sanskrit there are different words for friend. Mitra, bandhu, suhrit. Mitra means an ordinary friend. Bandhu means a good friend. Suhrit means heart to heart friend. I can die for you, you can die for me. Krishna is within our heart. He's such a good friend that we have rejected him for millions of lifetimes. But he loves us so much. If we once turn to him, he'll immediately accept us. Krishna is the withholder of creation. That means that the creation only takes place when Krishna desires it to do so. Krishna is, oh, here actually it's, he's using the word in different sense. I can see from the next verse, which, the next. Krishna is withholder, creator, and preserver. That means Krishna creates, maintains, and destroys the material world. Generally we think it's Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva, but actually it's all done by Vishnu. And Brahma and Shiva do so. Actually it's Krishna, we're saying Krishna, 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 Krishna is. So even Vishnu is an expansion of Krishna. So the guna avatars, Vishnu, Brahma and Shiva, they are simply representatives of Krishna, in one sense -sense non-different from Krishna, who is the ultimate creator, maintainer and destroyer of the creation. Krishna is the master of the functions of creation, etc., Yes, the power to create, maintain and destroy comes from Krishna. That's why Brahma, he has to meditate on Krishna. Then he gets power from Krishna to create. Not in the, he's not an independent creator. Krishna is devoid of distinction as of kinship, already stated. Krishna is devoid of distinction as between kin and alien, more or less already stated. Krishna indwells in the universe created by himself. Yes, Krishna as Mahavishnu creates the universe. Then as Garbhadakshay Vishnu, he enters within that universe and dwells within it. And also again as Shiradakshay Vishnu. So, Krishna is the destroyer of the worldly sojourn of his devotees. That's already stated also. And Krishna... But why it's being stated again? Because it's being quoted from a different verse. You see. And again, the last one is already... Uh, Krishna is the wearer of no, actually it's not stated before before we had that Krishna takes different forms according to the wish of his devotees and here it's stated the last one Krishna is the wearer of the of a body according to his own wish Krishna takes different forms according to his own desire these forms Ram, Rishinga, Varaha, Matsya, Kurma Krishna takes these forms you say why? because he wants to He's God. If he likes to, he can. 
He enjoys in various forms. This is Krishna. Krishna is everything. We'll finish there. All glories to Lord Sri Krishna on the festival of Janmashtami. All glories to Vedvyas who has compiled all this wonderful information about Krishna. All glories to Srila Bhaktis Dan Thakur who has collected these few well, this is a selection of statements about Krishna from the Srimad Bhagavatam 10th Canto and all glories to Srila Prabhupada who introduced us to all these wonderful personalities of whom the root wonderful personality is Krishna. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. They can't believe it's finished. <laughs>